Um, so two things, one, bathrooms are out that way uh, towards the far wall. And then the second thing everyone needs to know is that our fire exit is straight out the door to the left and then the left exit towards Duke Street. Um, and now because she's quite eager, uh, I'm gonna hand it over right over to Catherine Carroll who will give our keynote today for Accelerate DFX, designed for durability, longevity, and reliability. As I said, I'm Catherine, I'm CEO of Sober Steering. At Sober Steering, we develop transdermal biosensors that can diagnose the body's condition. And our first application is automotive. So we took these biosensors, we took, put them into the steering wheel of automobiles to detect and prevent drunk driving. Uh, so uh, to put this into context, what we have developed is an automotive safety system that is capable of locking up a school bus with 72 kids in the back. So for us, the concept of designing for reliability, durability, and longevity is something that we talk about every single day. And uh, we just launched our product in September for a 10 plus two contract, so that's 10 years plus a two year extension uh, in 500 school buses in the Waterloo region. Uh, so we've been developing this product for eight years now. It's, uh, it's been a long and interesting process, uh, right from first concept through to you know, the product launch in September. So what I'm gonna do today is talk about the sort of the business perspective of, of product development and how reliability, longevity play into that. So I'm not an engineer, I'm gonna take the business perspective and I'll let these guys speak more specific, specifically to engineering issues. Um, so, you see it as well? So designing for reliability, longevity, and durability is an iterative cycle. Uh, and our goal as a company is to shorten that iteration cycle and to minimize product faults in the field. Uh, and this is particularly important for us as an automotive safety uh, company. And I, I feel like after eight years, we've sort of perfected this development process. Uh, so this is my entire speech. The, the more, I, more time I spend doing this, the less I like PowerPoint. So. Everything you need to know is just right there. Um, so my, my, we break the development process into three sectors. Technology research, this is our core sensor technology. Product development, this is the system itself, the product. And then product testing. Um, and this is, from my perspective as the executive, I have to decide how we allocate the company's resources. And specifically, um, how we allocate them to commercialize a product. So when we talk about the first sector, this technology research, which we started, as I said, eight years ago, we uh, decided that the first thing that we needed to do was to define what reliability, longevity, durability meant for us. And this is critical for us as an automotive safety product. And thankfully, our, for the automotive sector, this is really well defined. So we knew from day one that we needed a product that could handle automotive temperature, negative 40 plus 85, vibration, dirt, um, dust, uh, and it also had to have a minimum lifespan of seven years. But as I said, we're, we're targeting that 10 year span. And then it also had to fit the automotive uh, pricing profile, which is about $250 or less all in per unit. So we started from day one as all hardware companies should, thinking about all of these issues. Because it really defines who we are as a company. And I'll give you an example why. So when we started in 2009 in Canada, we were told two things. The first thing people said is it can't be done. You cannot detect alcohol at the palm of the skin in less than you know 45 minutes. Well, in fact, right now, we can detect alcohol at the palm of the hand after three minutes after initial ingestion, so three to five minutes. So it, it's, it's, more, it's faster and more effective than a breathalyzer. So that was the first thing, couldn't be done. And the second thing is why would you bother? This, there's this great company called True Touch Technologies that is already developing something for transdermal detection. So True Touch Technologies has really great technology. They use this infrared spectroscopy. 
and it's this large box that sits on a desk and it can give you very precise me measurement of what your blood alcohol concentration is. And at that point, when we had started in 2009, they put about, I'm gonna say $50 million into development. Uh, they were by far the front runner in this concept of detecting alcohol transdermally uh, for automotive use. Um, but what we saw uh, was that while their core technology was really great, you couldn't use it in the automotive environment because that specific type of technology is extremely sensitive to vibration, extremely sensitive to fluctuations in temperature. So we saw an opportunity there. We realized that this company, our competitor, uh, who at this point has spent 10 times what we've spent on our product and still does not have an automotive prototype. You know, we have a commercialized product in the meantime. But they didn't consider these issues from day one, or they thought they could solve around them, and they still haven't. So for, for sober steering, you know, thinking about designing for reliability was at our, you know, at, from, very, from the very first day we started, was at the core of what we did. Uh, and, and that's why, because now eight years later, we have a product in the market that we intend to, you know, to live for seven years and hits all the automotive specs, which is important. Um, so yeah, what do you have to do? Define what reliability means to you, uh, what your client's expectations are, and what your specific business uh, objectives are. So we started with six sensor designs simultaneously to see which one would meet both the automotive specs and our business requirements fastest. Uh, we ended up you know, choosing two, and that meant we eliminated a lot of really great technology. We had developed sensor systems that were, I guess, more interesting scientifically than our existing product, but it would only have a lifespan of 18 months to two years. So that neat technology while fascinating to the engineers and the scientists who were creating it, was not commercially viable because longevity is an issue for us. So if we have to have a minimum of a seven year lifespan, I can't choose a technology, albeit very neat, that doesn't meet that requirement. And you have to be very disciplined, and this is, you know, I'm the one that's writing the checks, so I have to be very disciplined about saying, yeah, you're right, that's super neat, but it's not gonna work, shelve it. So we ended up shelving four of our six designs, ended up working with two of them, and we'll talk about sort of how those two product designs developed over the course of the years. Um, yep, so define your product for your client, for your own business objectives, and build to those requirements. Be disciplined in saying this product will work, this product will not work. Pull the plug if it's not meeting your specs. Um, and, and then, you know, get to know quickly. Uh, I, I'm sure everyone has heard this before, fail fast. So do the testing required, decide whether or not it meets your longevity, reliability requirements, and move on if they don't have it. So that's the first section, that's the research. Any questions there? Anybody? We can do this in a very casual, there's only a couple of you out here. Questions, anybody? All right, so moving on. So from the core scientific research, we then built a product so the electronics and the firmware around that sensor, which would be you know, a product to our clients. Uh, and the most important thing I can say about this part of the process is hire experts. Hire experts with expertise specifically in your sector. Do not pay for someone else's or even your own learning curve. Pay for their expertise and experience. And this has been a tremendous learning opportunity for us in, a, in several different ways. So the way that we do it now, just to, to give you a be best practice here, uh, we have hired high-level consultants because our resources are limited. We could not afford to hire any one of these consultants full time. But we have hired a, an electronics uh, consultant, a firmware consultant, and a manufacturing consultant. These are guys that, they all happen to be guys, that have about 20 years of experience in our sector. They really, really know what they're talking about. And that is so critically important in the product development path. Now, 
you know, we chose to do it this way. We hired the consultants. They sort of are moonlighting. They have their own jobs. They come in five to eight hours a week, more if necessary. And we partner them with junior groups, on, uh, like a, a, a junior member of our staff, so that they are doing the design work. They are, are, are steering the boat in the right direction, but they have the junior member on our team doing a lot of the grunt work. And that has, has proven very effective for us. Now, why am I so adamant about this? Let's go back to the idea of, okay, so through the research phase, we chose two sensors. One sensor we knew was sort of the direction we wanted to go, but there was this other neat sensor which we thought could uh, meet our, specifically our longevity requirements. So for this other sort of neat sensor, I went out and I got government subsidies, government funding to fund that sensor because I didn't, it wasn't good enough for me to put our investment resources into its development, but it was neat. Uh, so I got money, I put it into it, and we had a, a post-PhD researcher with tons of electronics experience sort of just run with it. While simultaneously we focused on this other sensor design which has developed into our product today. So we started with this core product, um, we were given a great recommendation to a brilliant guy, brilliant electronics guy, um, who spent nine months producing something that didn't work in the automotive sector. Brilliant as he may be, he didn't have automotive experience and it showed in his product. Uh, so we wasted nine months um, on something that simply just didn't work uh, reliably, and it really was about reliability. He couldn't get the product to work reliably when we put it in a school bus. So we had to scrap his entire design, and then we went out and found someone with spe specific expertise in the automotive sector. And within a couple of months, we had an extremely reliable, strong product. And so this is frustrating because I had to pay this guy to do this work for nine months. Um, in addition to that, I'm paying the, you know, the company to exist for those nine months of, of you know, low productivity. Um, but more importantly, it's the time that's required. Uh, when you're a startup, you want to get to commercialization as fast as possible. And I know eight years is a long time. Just for the record, automotive equipment's typically seven, so it's not crazy. Uh, <laughs> But this, this nine months, the, the amount of time that we wasted was really, really painful. So when we switched over to someone that had not only the expertise but the experience, the process went so much faster. Uh, it, it just felt so much better and we should have done that from, from day one. And we've been with this other um, consultant sense. And as I said, he's a consultant. So he will design, he'll do certain things, and then he'll ask our junior member to do other things and then come back to him. And he's in, he's in our office at, at least once a week. Now, this other technology that we had sort of percolating on this, percolating on the side, uh, that's an example of how to do things incorrectly. Uh, it didn't really matter, it wasn't our core product. I had subsidized funding for it, so we could just sort of test with it. But the, um, uh, the post-PhD post researcher that was developing it, he chose to do all of the electronics on his own, which is paying for someone's learning curve. So he would design, he would send the PCBs to be made. They would come back, stupid errors. You know, great, that's fine, but you know, it's $1,500, 2,000 2, of my dollars that you're spending to iterate your electronics design. Um, so he did that a couple of times before we said, all right, you're done, you need to bring in the specialist. Uh, so we would bring in the specialist just to review his designs, and it was just taking a really long time. So eventually we had to sit down and say, what are you doing every day? Like, what are you working on? And what we discovered was that, particularly with the university researchers, if they think something is interesting, they will pursue it to the end. Even though that issue or that bug that popped up only happens once out of every thousand times the system is used. You know, and then they'll say, but, I thought of a use case where theoretically this could happen. Okay, great, that's good to know. Write that on a list somewhere and let's focus on just core functionality, does your sensor work? Not does your sensor work at negative 40 when the user does this and the wind is just right. 
So there's a certain discipline that comes with a professional with industry experience who understands you're developing for a commercial product. You're not developing out of curiosity. Uh, so you know, we, would, we would waste months with the engineer just sort of pursuing these off little channels until we said enough. And I said to him, you've got 30 days, <laughs> you've got 30 days to put this sensor on a human being and test it or we're done. Magically in 30 days, uh, he had a design, he sent it out to be batch manufactured. And what we found, because he had been developing in ones and twos, what we found when we went to develop 20 of them is that the manufacturing tolerances could not, uh, manufacturing tolerances of the PCBs were too great to support his specific design. So he said, came back and said, well, we can't do the standard manufacturing. We're going to have to go with this expensive manufacturing. Ken, I'm the one writing the check. And I said, nope, we're done. Because to get that into a product means that you've just multiplied the product price per unit product price by five. And that makes it not a viable commercial product. Does it work? Yeah. Is it neat? Yeah. Is it really novel in the scientific community? Yes. Is it a commercial product? Does it meet our requirements for durability, longevity? Nope. Does it meet our client requirements? Not really, because if it only has an 18-month lifespan, it's not going to do it. So here's an example of the engineer who didn't have the experience, who was let to just go do what he wanted, and he didn't get to know fast enough. So again, subsidized funding, not a big deal, but it took us 18, 24 months to get to know when if it had been a professional, we would have gotten to know a lot faster. So there's you know, just an example of our learning curve in, in deciding when you do product development, when you transition from research to product development, hire the professionals. It'll be more expensive in the, you know, in the front end, but at the end of the day, it'll definitely be worth your time. Uh, so that leaves us in the product testing area. Now this is, you know, if you have a product where, and all of you do, Reliability, durability, longevity matter. This is where you live and breathe. So uh, a couple points on product testing. Do the work. Don't trust component specifications just because they say so. You know, if, if, if you get a component and it comes in and it says, yes, absolutely, we're an automotive spec, um, don't trust it. Actually do the work. Understand what its tolerances are in your own lab. Uh, it takes longer, yes. It's tedious, yes. But then you'll have the confidence of knowing that when you put that product in the market, it doesn't automatically fail. Uh, and don't just do the important components. Do all the components. Make sure they all work uh, you know, before you put it into a prototype. There's, there's no way of getting around that. Um, the next point is, uh, again, this is sort of to the, to the example that I just gave you. Beware of tinkering. You know, I follow an 80-20 rule. If in the process of testing, a bug pops up, how important is that bug? Do you allow the engineers to chase it down for three, four, six weeks? Or do you say, this is a prototype, get it in the field, acknowledge that this exists, let your users know that it exists, and we'll get to it as soon as we prove out all of our core functionality. Um, so do the work on the components, beware of engineers tinkering in the testing process indefinitely. You know, don't explore the outer edges of use cases. Just focus on your core functionality and build out to those uh, outer edges. Otherwise, you'll, you, know, you can spend months out there chasing down every little thing that pops up. Uh, and, and then most critically, there is no substitute for field data. Get your product in, you know, I call them the ugly products. Get your ugly products in front of users as fast as possible. There's no such thing as a perfect prototype. Follow the 80-20 rule. The big issues will fall out really, really quickly. And then you'll be able to handle those big issues. There's no point chasing down little things when your fundamental, like when your sensor doesn't detect alcohol. So you, you really have to focus on what's important first. Also, um, do not... <laughs> Do not give your product to people who have a vested interest in the success of your company and think that that's meaningful data. It's not. So if one of your engineer's wives takes it home and tests it, that doesn't mean it, work. it, doesn't mean it works. Um, and particularly for us, because we have unwilling users. So we work in the commercial fleet space. The drivers don't like using our product. 
So the best way to find out how much they hate it is to put it in front of them, and they'll just come right out and tell you. Um, so yeah, don't just do the work when it comes to the testing. Don't take any uh, short shortcuts when it comes to components. Um, what else? So I think that that is about it from our use cases. This is our, our, our takeaways. Start from day one. Uh, you have to build to your client's expectations and your business goals when it comes to uh, reliability, longevity, uh, durability. Uh, don't build to your product if you need a 10-year lifespan. It's really very straightforward. Um, when you're building your develop, uh, when you're developing your product around your core technology, hire the best. Hire the expertise and experience. Pay for the expertise and the experience. Don't pay for someone else's learning curve. Um, and then there is no substitute for field data ever. And I think that that is um, that is a. About it, oh, we had questions earlier about, uh, you know, what about UL um, CE testing? This sort of thing uh, goes into hiring experts. We don't worry about UL and CE testing. If you hire experts, they've done it before. They know the testing firms. They know the process. They will develop to their specifications. So it becomes less of a problem if you hire the right designer. Same thing with components. If you hire a manufacturing guy, who can go through your bomb and say, here's your end of life analysis, that takes a lot of the concern away. And they know it because they've got 20 years of experience. And they know the component suppliers, they know the contract manufacturers. So they can go in and to a contract manufacturer, and I recommend small batches based in Ontario to start, uh, and, and they can work with the contract manufacturer in building a product that isn't going to be obsolete going forward. Uh, so again, that's the benefit that comes with working with you know, high expertise, High experience individuals or firms like Swift. Any questions? BOM, Bill of Materials Obsolescence. So that's, ex that's uh, when you come up with your Bill of Materials, your manufacturing consultant or your, your firm will go through and identify which components are in risk of obsolescence or end of life. Yeah. Correct. It's not about our competitors, it's about our products. So if we're developing for automotive, the minimum a component is expected, the minimum a component is expected to last is seven years. The average, just for school buses, because that's our first target, the average target, uh, the average school bus life is 13 years. So all of our contracts are for this, for this product are, are 10 years plus two automatic extension. So our goal from a business perspective is to put as little into manufacturing as possible. So I want that product to last 10 years. Um, is it okay if it lasts seven? Yeah, it is, because then you're gonna hope that most of them last 10 and you just replace a couple of them. But can I you know, develop a product that has an expected lifespan of two to three years? No, because I can't make my margins. I won't survive as a business um, financially from that perspective. Any other questions? Anybody? Um, you touched on the tank rate, that might be 20 analysis. Okay. Yeah. I think I do it pretty frequently. Uh, I do. I mean, there's, I, 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 have, I have this long-held belief, understandably, that the engineers are afraid to put their product in the market. Um, whereas, you know, from the client perspective, I want it in the market immediately. Uh, so they're all, I, I feel like they're always finding one little extra thing that needs to be solved before we're ready to let go. Um, so. Personally, I, uh, let's see, specific examples. For our product, we have a lot of components like pumps and heaters. So they will say, you know, we've, we've tested this product and we know that the automotive specs are 40 to 85. We're getting it to, you know, plus 70 Celsius. 
Oh, I'm like, okay, you know, at some point we'll push it to point eighty, you know, plus eighty five. But right now, plus seventy is going to work in a school bus. Uh, so for our first target market, rather than spending the extra six weeks to 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 do additional testing from the plus seventy to plus eighty five sector of the temperature spectrum, let's just put it out now because you know what are the chances the school bus is going to get plus seventy Celsius? It's just not. Uh, so those sorts of things. You know, from, from a curiosity perspective, you know, they've got a sheet in front of them and they say, you know, but we have to meet plus 85. And I'd say, yeah, you do. Uh, but let's just see if the alcohol sensor works first. And then we'll see if it goes from, you know, plus 70 to plus 85 Celsius. So that's an example. All right, I think that's it. So as is habit, I didn't get a chance to introduce myself earlier because I forgot. So um, my name is David Hussey. I work with the Accelerator Center at the Advanced Manufacturing and Hardware Innovation Lab. Uh, so thank you all for coming. Uh, I know some of you have been here for all four sessions, so we're really, really stoked that you've been here. Uh, I'm going to take a chance to, and I've lost a bet, so I have to say this. I'm going to introduce Don Thompson, AKA the King of 44 Gockle, um, and who is going to be moderating the panel, and he'll pretty much take it from there. Thanks, Don. Thanks, bud. Okay, um, so what I'll do, for those who don't know me, Don Thompson, I'm the product development uh, mentor at the AC, and I've been moderating these for the last three weeks, and now we're on the last one. So what we'll be doing today is just talking to each of the uh, panel attendees. I'll get them to introduce themselves. Uh, I've got a bunch of questions here that I've written down from the presentation that was uh, just given, as well as past dis uh, discussions we've all had and what have you. But if there are questions, please raise your hand and I will call on you. Okay? So with that, I'll let our Mike hand it off and start, uh, just introduce and we'll go down the lane. Uh, my name is Mike Brown. I'm the Director of Business Development for a company locally called Swift Labs. Uh, we primarily do hardware design and product development. Um, we also have an arm that does uh, certification, compliance, uh, management, uh, and we also have some test equipment in our lab, so we can do uh, some development testing and things of that nature. Um, my name's Bob Rushby. I'm the technology mentor at the Accelerator Center. I'm, uh, I retired in 2011 after 12 years at Christie Digital, where I was the uh, chief technology officer. Before that, I was a vice president of engineering and operations at a company in Toronto that made uh, called Delfax that made the world's fastest electronic printers at the time. Prior to that, I was the director of engineering at um, NCR Corporation, where I was also for a short while a director of product management as well. So I've developed a lot of products, and I've had a lot of products in the field, and I understand uh, the importance of reliability, durability, and longevity, and I've made my share of mistakes, and hopefully I'll help you learn from those. I'm uh, Dr. Bev Christian. I'm a project facilitator for a research consortium called the High Density Package User Group, which does research on the reliability of electronics. I've been a university professor, worked at Nortel for 10 years, uh, BlackBerry for 15. And um, my labs were failure analysis labs, so I have seen many cases where things don't work because people haven't done what Catherine has said they should do. So I just want to, uh, I learned something new today. I hope you guys do as well. I didn't know that Bob is a recovering product manager. <laughs> That's impressive. I did not know that. So I knew he was smart, but. Uh, so it, it's quite interesting. And, and one of the things I wrote down was, uh, you know, if you think it's, it's expensive to hire a professional, wait until you hire an amateur. It's, it's so true. Uh, we all have experience with that occurring in our, in our careers. And would it be interesting just to, I want to pull on that thread a little bit because all of us are consultants in some way and we're all experts in our field. So, you know, we'll start with Mike because you've got a consulting lab and just, you know, give us, give us a sense of, you know, what, is, what does it look like to engage with, with Rodi in terms of, you know, costs and just general, what does the engagement look like and, and how could people be engaging with you on these types of topics? Um, I think there's, I mean, there's a lot of different ways that we work with our customers. Um, a lot of our customers come in for specific types of uh, consulting advice. So, um, as Catherine mentioned in her speech, um, you know, firmware development or electronics or certification um, or manufacturing. Um, we have a kind of a team that does 
pretty much end-to-end -end product development. So um, <clears throat> everyone has their own requirements about what they need and what kind of gap they need to fill in their own organization. Um, so in some cases, we do very large full development projects as an entire team together. And in some cases, we do things like, I just need someone to help me decide if my bomb has obsolete, obsolete parts in it. Um, and in, in all cases, there's, you know, you have these requirements that you need to kind of design for or help your company get through. So um, if you have a guy who's done 20 years of experience of that type of, uh, that type of work, then sometimes it's significantly um, faster hmm. uh, to get your product And, and from the or, first session we did, I, I recall that we should be taking advantage of the free time yes. that consultants are going to provide. That first call is always free. Yep. Uh, but certainly there are, you know, you guys cover a wide range of services, yep. right? Um, okay, so that's, it's good to know because it's important for startups to know that they do have people they can turn to, mm -hmm. uh, and Swift Labs certainly has a lot of high quality people there uh, that can help out. So one of the things I'm, I'm wondering about, it, it's, it's always tickled in the back of my head. So as a product manager, I've put together reliability specifications, and you know, I've, I've got various sources I can go to, but certainly I'd, be, I'd love to know more from Bob, perhaps, just where can you get some of the sources of reliability you know, requirements gathering, since you're a recovering product manager? Uh, I'll, I'll put you to the test and just see what, uh, where do you go to get that information? It depends, Doug. Damn you. Um, it, 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 and the reason it depends, if you're doing a derivative product or a product that's, there's a, the classes of that product are already out in the marketplace, then, you've, then you're fortunate because you have a data points that you can uh, determine uh, whether they're important and whether you can compete against, uh, with them and whether you can improve upon them. For products like Catherine's, which are novel, which are innovative, where there really isn't anything out like that you know, on buses out there, then you, you, it, it, it's much more exploratory. It's a negotiation with your, with your clients, it's an understanding of your application space, um, and it's this constant yin and yang uh, trade-off of what um, the specification might require, or what you think require, what, and what you judge the real world um, would would say. So actually I want to turn this to a question to you, Catherine. Mm -hmm. you, you, made the, you gave the example of, I, I think, uh, one particular specification was 70 degrees C and you felt you could make 50 or some difference anyways. Um, how did, the question is, how did you get the, the first parameter and then how did you decide the second parameter was the right one? So the first parameter is the automotive specifications. If you want to build a product that the automotive manufacturers will use, the product has to survive within temperatures of negative 40 to plus 85. They have to survive and, and function properly. Um, so that was our goal. That was the target we were aiming to hit. But realistically, the subsector of automotive that we were in, which was school buses, is not going to see those outer the, the outer reaches of those specifications. Uh, it just doesn't happen, and it certainly doesn't happen in Ontario. Uh, so I knew that in that area, the reliability requirements, the, the specifications, could be eased up a little bit. Um, in other areas, not so much, but that's one we did have a little flexibility on. Hmm. And it's so interesting the, the difference between reliability requirements and operating conditions. Yeah. I think the key takeaway from what Catherine said is you need to understand your application yes. space, and you need to also set your customers' expectations accordingly. Right. Um, last thing you want is Bluebird bus lines to test your product 85 degrees C right. when they should expect it to work till 70 degrees right. C. Mm. Because this is reliability in operating conditions. Yep. So we, we knew we, we had to, we had to, we knew how we had to perform, but you don't always have to perform that in all conditions. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that also goes to the idea of when does testing become tinkering? Um, you know, when it's a very small percentage of use cases where you would find this particular phenomenon. So it's interesting. I know uh, and Bev and I used to work, full disclosure, together at BlackBerry, uh, and I had to go through horrible, horrible tests that his lab would perform on my products, uh, which I hated because they were tough to pass. And, but there's a reason for that. They're, they're tough to pass because you do want to find them in your conditions, not with the customer. So what are some of the, like, 
tests? Like, I don't, I'm assuming we don't drive the bus at 85 degrees C, because that kind of sucks. So what are some of the tests? What does it look like, Bev, just to give people kind of a one-on-one -on -one level of just what are the things that they can expect to go through from a testing, and what does that equipment look like? Do you want to talk about testing of the materials that go into the product or the, or the product that's going to go out to the, to the customer? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Start at the, at, the, at the atomic level, and then we'll work our way up. Okay, well, we usually don't start at atomic levels. <laughs> well, sort of. Designers have come to us with products that have uh, gold-touching tin. Mm -hmm. And if any of you remember your grade 12 chemistry, that is not a good thing to do because you're going to get galvanic corrosion because the metals are so dissimilar. Mm -hmm. So that's where you know, we can start yep. really at the atomic level. Okay. Uh, but uh, we would test uh, components for um, ability to take in moisture because that's bad news uh, because when you put them on the manufacturing line they can popcorn and destroy the, uh, the gold bonds inside the component. We would be uh, testing uh, component uh, circuit boards that come off the end of the manufacturing line to see the quality of the manufacturing because if they didn't manufacture the boards uh, properly, even though you had a good design, your product isn't going to work. And then as far as the fi final product, of course a lot of that is going to uh, depend upon the use conditions and the lifetime that you expect that to, to uh, uh, survive. But certainly you're going to be looking at uh, things like accelerated uh, thermal testing to look <coughs> at the difference of coefficient of expansion between the parts and the board. So as things go back and forth like this, are you going to break your solder joints, have the parts fall off? And those conditions will vary whether you're talking about space, medical, military, school buses, uh, cell phones, or throwaway toys. Uh, but there are specs for all those different uh, conditions, and uh, they have to be met. Mm -hmm. uh, for Blackberries, of course, drop testing was a big one, uh, as you can imagine, as, as it is for Samsung and Apple as well. But I'd say Blackberry did better. Um, <laughs> and... Um, I mean, there are so many, we could be here all afternoon. Yeah. Well, and so when you think about, you know, some of the tests that we talk about, and I'll, I'll use an example from my past, and, and maybe it'll, it'll help out, but I remember the first time we had to do vibration testing when I worked in a, a large equipment uh, product space, and we didn't have a vibration table, but we had a paint shaker. <laughs> so the engineers thought they'd be really smart and said, if it passes this, it'll pass anything. Well, it didn't pass. And then now it's, okay, what do we go do? So there are tests that are fit for purpose and tests that aren't fit for purpose. So, you know, the paint shaker is not to be used for, for vibration testing. You know, go get a, an outsourced vibration tester. But, you know, when I look at you know, what you spoke about there, Bev, is the idea that different products have different requirements of them. So BlackBerry being a mobile device, you know, we had the sit on bum test, right, which I wouldn't even have thought about. Uh, when you have, we didn't have the hammer nail in test, but it did, it could have hammered a nail in. When you have uh, consumer toys, you know, there's a very different testing requirement there. So for the people, like everybody's doing different types of products. We've got, you know, pet toys I know about. We've got ho in-home toys. I've got people who are doing uh, adaptive clothing. You know, where can people get the, the, the knowledge of the specifications that are required for the different verticals that they're trying to go into? I don't know of all the sources, but certainly one of them is uh, from an organization called IPC, uh, mm -hmm. based out of Chicago. Their main uh, uh, center is in the manufacturing specifications, but they do have specifications on uh, reliability conditions. I think it's uh, 785 is the number, if I'm not mistaken, that lists the different uh, conditions you must meet uh, for space, medical, military, automotive, uh, consumer, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, that's one source. And there's another organization called the IEC, which is the International Electrotechnical Commission, which is a branch of the United Nations, and they also have specifications on reliability, uh, but I'm not as familiar with those. And then, of course, there are Japanese ones as well, but they're always in Japanese, so unless you uh, speak Japanese, uh, they're not going to be of much use to you. So those are the three main sources that I know of for documents that would talk about uh, uh, reliability um, testing conditions. 
One source of unreliability that often gets forgotten is just simply shipping the product from your back door to your customer's front door. Mm -hmm. uh, it, your point about the shake table, tweak that, Don. Um, you, those are test situations that your customer hasn't specified other than the fact that you obviously, they obviously expect the product to work when it gets there. There are standards as well in the industry for shipping by rail, mm -hmm. shipping by road, uh, shipping by air, and shipping by sea mm -hmm. that uh, ought to be taken into account in your, in, in your test programs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the worst thing you can do is work so hard to develop a product and then ship a box of parts because when it gets there, it's all broken apart, right? So, when, you know, Catherine, when you think about your, you, you really stress the importance of having a specification of really designing in for reliability and durability and longevity. So how did you, how did you articulate that to the engineers? Very clearly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, well, I, I think particularly most of us are in small companies. There, there is constant conversation mm -hmm. um, between the people who talk to the clients, mm -hmm. the people who are designing the products, and the people you know, who are coming in and engineering. And there has to be constant conversation. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't a matter of my sitting down and coming up with you know, a spec sheet that says, here are the defined specs for the product. It's a matter of all of us working together constantly to make sure that it worked. Mm -hmm. um, so for us, that's how we made it clear to them. Mm -hmm. And so you had your own in-house engineering team oh, yeah. for the most part, right? For sure. So some, I'm assuming some of you are using external engineering resources, right? Not everybody has the expertise necessarily in-house. I'm not sure, like, Mike, when somebody's working with you, if they've outsourced the design, what kind of stuff are you seeing from your startup customers to real, be able to articulate this to you? Um, there's a huge variety. Um, a lot of people have really no idea how to <laughs> articulate their product. How practice. would you like to see it? <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, I take the almost opposite approach of Catherine, where I would love to have a full the decked out product requirements of document course. that's 25 pages and calls out the IEC standards for reliability <laughs> and the IEC standards for EMC and all these things. But um, I think a lot of it is you just need to look at what the product is being used for. What right. is the application? Mm -hmm. And then we can help them guide them into those standards. So if your product is not a medical requirement, then there's no point in looking at FDA requirements. Um, and I would start with client expectations. Mm -hmm. Who is your target market? What are their expert expectations of how that product will be used, what, how long it will last, et cetera? Mm -hmm. And then sort of build backwards from that. Yeah. So a lot of the, the standards that I will call it, and you guys were talking about different kind of standards organizations, um, I always look at the certification requirements, partly because we're a certification company, but also because that's the final yes or no. So we're talking here a lot about product application and how the product's going to work internally, mm -hmm. but externally there's your certification requirements for EMC and RF and all these things. Um, and so a lot of those are standards that you can go and purchase from UL or from some sort of commission, or you can Google them and you can find usually some older standards to the IEC stuff. Um, but if you don't know where your product is going, that kind of puts a wrench in where you're... It all starts from the customer. Going. Yeah. So if it starts from your customer, then you just need to allow them to kind of get to the point where they know where they're trying to go, what they're trying to do, what is the application, and then you can say, okay, well, you know, you're, these are the standards that you should be looking at as a base level, mm. and then you go to the next level, which is, okay, how long do I want the product to market, and, you know, how, what is the operating temperature? Operating temperature is always kind of a funny one because a lot of the time you might develop it to some standard, like you say, and then, you know, maybe it's not really required for that standard. So that's when you can just kind of on paper say, okay, now it's 80 degrees instead of 85 because that's what we've designed and we can reliably state that. Mm -hmm. And different countries have different requirements around that too, so. Oh, of course. <clears throat> All right, you go, go ahead, expand. Yeah. I, think that's, I think that's where hiring your experts come yep. in. You need to figure out what your client wants, how it's gonna work, and then you say, okay, I need to get help here from someone who knows these standards like the back mm -hmm. of their hand and can sort of guide it from there. I mean, yeah. Google, I'm sorry, Googling standards and thinking you're going to develop to the Google standards are just, Dangerous. Yeah. And it, it's, it's, and it's interesting. It's, and what I like what you said in your presentation was, you know, the importance of experts. Hire it, don't try to learn it, right? And so, again, Swift Labs and what have you certainly have those uh, support services. Um, are there any questions? Go ahead, sir. Just about when you mentioned the Japanese uh, manufacturing, is that using components or would that sell these to the market? I, well, I'm not really 
really very familiar with the, uh, the Japanese standards, but uh, certainly uh, knowing uh, the Japanese mentality, there would be standards from, uh, from uh, conception to actually putting on the market, but again, they would be in Japanese, so they would not be readily available to uh, most people in North America. Yeah, so I can actually give you an example specifically for Japan. Um, <clears throat> so Japan has some protection requirements for their RF testing, such that you're not allowed to be able to easily access the RF path uh, of your product as a external user. So they have requirements from a uh, build and assembly perspective that you have to prove to them that there's no way that someone could easily add a new antenna hmm. or a higher gain antenna such that your RF testing would be invalidated. So those are things that in North America is not, there's no protection requirements for the FCC, um, but the equivalent and even the FCC and um, the Japanese authority have an, a, a mutual recognition agreement of the testing requirements. But if you actually went to go get those uh, that certification in Japan, then they would have different requirements from a assembly perspective that you would never have to do in North America. So there's a lot of different things um, that you have to kind of keep aware of when you start looking into doing global market access. Mm -hmm. uh, that, I mean, North America is one of the most simple markets actually to get into from a electronics perspective. Mm. Good. Okay. Um, so I want to, I want to, uh, it, this is one I, I, I enjoy talking about, is the idea of sometimes you need to shoot the engineer and launch the product. It's, uh, I can say that, I, I'm allowed. Um, because it, it is, uh, you talk about tinkering and, and you know, polishing the apple, right, and, and moving forward. So, you know, can you, you know, actually I'll go, I'll throw this at Bob, because I want him to talk about shooting engineers. Um, I think the, the, you know, where was an example of that, where you actually had, you know, as a senior executive, you had to make the call. You do, and I've had to make that call many times because the product's never perfect. Right. There's always errata on the errata sheet. There's always some spec that you're going to have to sign off on, like Catherine's described in, in her example. On the other hand, it's important to remember that your engineers, you, you pay them to worry. You do. Uh, the, the way an engineer is taught to think, and many of us in this room are engineers, is we're, t we're taught to look for problems and then, and then work with others, ourselves, our own decisions, management, whoever, to, to decide whether the problem is relevant, worthwhile addressing or not. But don't shoot them, listen to them, <laughs> and then, you know, buy them some ice cream. <laughs> well, no, buy them some ice cream and, 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 and listen to them again the next time. <laughs> Um, and b because they're always they're usually worth listening to. I, I also want to point out that engineers aren't always experts. I, I I understand what you were saying, Catherine, about hiring engineers that know what they're doing about agency certification. I've had a lot of really great engineers work for me. I've never had an engineer say that they didn't design for safety and for compliance, but compliance is complicated. And there's nuances to it. You, you know, the Japanese requirements versus the um, U.S. requirements versus Industry Canada versus CE versus, you know, God knows where. So the nuances are where, are where you actually need outside eyes like yours or we used to bring in UL or CSA uh, in very early in the design process. We used to bring in Ultratech for compliant, EMC compliance. Uh, bring in outside eyes because they will... You, you have, nobody can be an expert in everything. Design's complicated, and, and use outside eyes as much as you can. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and it's, it's quite interesting. Uh, what I find with a lot of founders is, um, especially when they're technical founders, is they get, really, they get too close to the problem, and, and I'm sure you've seen it, Bev, in terms of you know, the, uh, I think I may have come down to the lab yelling and screaming, going, why isn't my product launching, right? Because it's, and it's just because I'm too close to it. So are there some examples where you really had to step in as, you know, that authority to say, no, I can't, and here's why? Right, so this would be examples of where you do shoot the engineer and not launch the product. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, but seriously, you need to do it in, in a good way, because if you're a, a lab rat like I am, 
your design engineers are your customers and you want them to trust you and you want them to come back. Right. You don't want to insult them. But I will say to those of you in the room, and uh, other than Bob and Mr. Carroll there, I think most of you are younger than the three of us, um, <clears throat> please take this the right way. Uh, you are brilliant people and you probably have a lot of brilliant ideas, but as Carol and others have alluded to, you do not know everything. And there will come, uh, come times when we're going to have to tell you, hopefully gently and politely, that you don't know anything uh, in this particular area that you think you do, right? You've got a swelled head and you need to bite your tongue and take the advice that we give you and go back and fix your mistake. So uh, I think I'm just that's, gonna, that's I'm gonna step in. That's a I'm, hard lesson for some people to take. Well, especially for our millennial friends here, so there will be cake and uh, balloons afterwards to make you feel better. Yeah. It's a tough lesson though, right? Yes. It's one of those things where sometimes, you know, you don't know what you don't, you don't know what you don't know, right. and you can get blinded by the desire to get to market. Right. You know, I'm, especially with a hardware company, typically I'm, you know, I'm one step ahead of, you know, the rent lady coming to, to, to collect. And so it's really, it's, it's tough and you can make really poor decisions. So what I want to pivot to is just, you know, the cost of, of not listening, right? Where, okay, Bev, screw it. I'm, I'm going around you, right? And, and I can do that because it's my product. I'm, I'm my own founder, right? So... Give me some examples, like what are, what are some of the examples you've seen of just the cost of not listening? I'll give one and I'll try to keep it as anonymous as I can. Absolutely, keep it anonymous, protect the guilty. <clears throat> so uh, this company that will re remain nameless that I worked for was coming out with a new product and the design engineers uh, had bizarrely picked a component that was used in greeting cards uh, for a key component in this product. And we said, you can't do this. Uh, this is going to fail in a number of days, let alone weeks or months. And they said, but we've got to, we've got this deadline to meet. And we said, listen, you can't do this. And they went ahead and did it anyway, and the product failed. Yeah, and there's there's small consolation in saying you're right, unfortunately. Yeah. Go, Bob. Because we get paid by that product being successful. successful. Yeah, absolutely. So they don't get paid, I don't get paid. Yeah. There are times, you, many times, especially once the product's launched, that you also need to not just listen to the engineers, you need to listen to your manufacturing and mm -hmm. supply chain people. So longevity, and what I'm focusing on is longevity and how you're going to service it and maintain a product that's in the field for however many years you're committing to do it. Engineers will like to tinker and they will like to improve. They'll, they'll be driven to reduce cost and whatever, and ECOs occur on the product after it's launched. Those ECOs stack up to, to, to get to a point where the products in the field may actually not be serviceable because the assemblies you're making uh, now cannot, won't fit, won't service, can't, be, can't uh, function with the product that you shipped three years ago, even though notionally it's the same product. So you need to listen to your supply chain people, your manufacturing people, uh, it's, it's an element of bureaucracy that, you know, startups hate bureaucracy. You say, let's, we're, we're better, we, we don't have to deal with that nonsense. It's not, it's not nonsense. You will, longevity is a long time. Uh, I, r I'm really interested in uh, products like yours that have to be in the field for 10 years. The Christie Digital Cinema Projectors, we committed contractually to support them uh, and maintain them and service them in the field for 10 years or longer. Uh, there's, there, there's more than just the design. There's your operational policies, uh, there's your fit form function uh, ECO change rules, all of these things are really important to, uh, to keep your product uh, supportable in the long term. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a quick one on this Yeah, one. go. Um, <clears throat> also a nameless company that we all work for in town. <laughs> um, we had an issue with uh, a product that was so successful that we just ran out of parts. And the company who was producing these parts just didn't have any left, couldn't supply them. Um, and this was not one of those parts that you could just dual supply. It's not like a resistor or something that you can just easily throw something else on. So we actually had to find a warehouse from a competitor who had been using that part, rip the components off of the competitor's boards and put them in our own devices. And I think we did that for about 10 million units or something like that. 
So designing in, uh, luckily they had 10 million users of their own around. <clears throat> um, so designing in uh, com uh, components that can be used in a long term is a challenging thing to do. Um, and that's something you should really consider if you have a longer term product. If you're spinning new devices every two years or something like that, maybe that's not such a concern for you, but in the case of seven years or 10 years, that's something that you should really consider. Well, so Catherine, what are some of the things that you've done just to hedge yourself against those challenges that are going to come up with your obviously longer platform play? I hired a manufacturing expert. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's exactly what we did. So what did he or she do? Uh, well, the first thing that they did was establish relationships with the suppliers and the contract manufacturers. Right. And then we defined, oh, then we decided to do small batch manufacturing here in Ontario so that we could do that iterative testing in the field. Uh, and, and, you know, this is a side point, but one of the great things that they did was they set up a year's long run. They said, okay, with the contract manufacturer, we're going to manufacture this number of units over the course of the year. Mm -hmm. So given that volume, right. give us the small batches at that volume price, which we got because mm -hmm. they had existing relationships. And I think mm -hmm. having these existing relationships is really important, mm -hmm. um, both with the suppliers and the manufacturers. Because the, you know, what we also did is we went through the bomb and said, here are all the risky components. Mm -hmm. How do we de-risk on a component by component basis? Right. Um, and, and that's not something we could have ever done in-house. Mm -hmm. uh, we had to have someone that had the relationship, so he sort of had the inside track on what was, mm -hmm. what was happening with the components, and then the manufacturer uh, relationships with the contract manufacturers. Mm -hmm. um, so that, yeah. that like, de-risking the bomb for a product that's intended to be in the field that long mm -hmm. is incredibly important. Yeah. And then also setting up the, the, the test module at the end of the run. So we have the manufacturing, and then we have a test procedure. And then we have a test procedure in-house. We get a couple of them, we test them. Mm -hmm. now, there are always issues. That's there are always going to be issues. It's a matter of minimizing them, de-risking that right. process. So that's what we did. We hired an expert. Hired the expert. <laughs> Jeez, it's a good call out for the consultants in the room. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you if, but if you don't, <laughs> and you have one component that fails on a ten-year product, I'm gonna. It, it's not a matter of replacing the product. That's not the expensive part. Hmm. It's sending someone out to every single bus yep. to pull them out. Right. It's that installation, it's that human manpower cost that's tremendous. Right. I mean, just replacing it, fine, whatever. But sending someone out to fix your mistakes in the field is... It, 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 it's the idea of, and okay. automotive is a great example where, you know, a $3 mistake costs you, you know, $3,000 per vehicle with all the time and effort and energy that's taken for it. Plus, you know, this is the thing with hardware that is, is so hard, is, is so important to stress in that it's, once it's out there, it's, a, it, it's alive and it's, it's never coming back. With software, you can send out a new code base and people install it and it's, it's not as difficult. But hardware, you know, the idea of doing, doing a recall on hardware is so incredibly painful. I do not wish this on anybody, uh, having gone through one before. And so, you know, some of the costs of, of recalls and, and something maybe Bev, you know, you had any experience with that was, uh, no, okay, I want to keep the people who are innocent off the list. So from a recall perspective then, Bob, I know, I'm sure that you've had some experience. Um, I've never had to do a recall in the classic government insurance right. sense, sure. but I've certainly had to do major field retrofits right. of FUBARs. And, um, Does everybody know what FUBAR is? <laughs> We'll tell you after. So <laughs> the, um, those old guys have experienced our share. <laughs> um, and when stuff happens, uh, a part goes out of spec and we didn't know it, and, but it's a critical component that means our product in the field can or, or can't function according to its, um, its specs. So we had one that was about three quarters of a million dollars that I can think of at Christie because of some a uh, supplier of a jelly bean component, a potentiometer that wouldn't, that the, wasn't designed for the flux cleaning process that our, our, uh, our board manufacturer used and uh, cost us three quarters of a million dollars and a lot of bad will. Mm -hmm. And our, uh, it's, so that's, that's, that's really expensive. Yeah. Okay, do you have something, Catherine? My recommendation for hardware companies mm. would be to get it right in your backyard first. Mm. You know, there's a reason we're in school buses. It's not because it's the most profitable sector. And there's a reason we're in Ontario. Because when stuff does happen, and it does, 
uh, we can fix it. I was talking to someone who has a, a hardware product last week and they were talking about how they had launched their hardware product online and they now have products in Asia and California and, and I just started you know to get the sweats thinking about oh my god <laughs> you know you haven't been in this business long enough to really understand what goes wrong um, and you've never had your product in the field before so they sent a, a, a pro you know they had done product testing but doing product testing and having a product in the field mm -hmm. where you're different collecting things. data yeah. is totally different so in my head I'm thinking that is going to be one messy fix if anything goes wrong. Right. So, you know, to, to minimize the risk of these problems, like get your product right in the field in your own backyard and then expand outward because trying to recall or do retrofits, it's, it's, it's nasty. I mean, just as a, a point of reference, so we have units out on the field and they're all, you know, it's IoT related. So we can check on those units twice a day on every single unit. So we have data coming in from the field twice a day, every day, so that we can see performance and how each one of these units is performing. Mm -hmm. That's not coincidence. We did it intentionally here in Ontario so that we could get that field data mm -hmm. before we send stuff to you know, South Africa. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, that would be my, one of my top recommendations is work in your own backyard to get it right before mm -hmm. you throw it online. <laughs> In addition to that, I think you need constant vigilance, to, vigilance to, to monitor how your products are performing in the field over the long term because they can give you early warning when things go wrong. A particular example I, I mentioned uh, took uh, five or six months to manifest itself in the, in the product in the field. So um, the sooner you find these things and whatever it is and, and react to it uh, is important. I think we also need to remember that for a product to last however long in the field, in your case 10 years, or in Christie Projectors 10 years in the field, doesn't mean they can't fail in 10 years. Um, main maintaining products, servicing products can actually be a source of profit very profitable revenue for you. And, and you need to take in the, into account the serviceability and maintainability of your products uh, in the field and think through how you can uh, while treating your customers fairly, turn it into a, a source of long-term profit for your for your organization. <clears throat> yeah, it's it's it, it's interesting. The um, what always goes through my head when we think about this is the bat whole bathtub curve, right? And we have to obviously manage that bathtub curve, um, and the difference between my reliability and my warranty period are is something to to maybe dive into a little bit. So a lot of people who are doing consumer products go, hey, I've got a 30-day warranty. Why the hell do I care about five-year reliability or the specs that I'm told by IESTA and IEC and some Japanese guy? So what are, what is, how can we talk about the warranty period and how it relates to reliability and some of the testing we may do? Is that something, Bev, that you could maybe talk about? Uh, not really. I, I would just say that... 30-day warranty, boy, what kind of product is that? I hope none of you are building anything like that. Um, Consumer products. Hockey sticks. Yeah. <laughs> Pet toys. I mean, um, Catherine's right, you need to get your product out there uh, quickly, but not too quickly. And certainly, if I was building a product with a 30-day warranty, I think I would make sure that it would meet 45 before I put it out there, mm. uh, if you're gonna go with something that low. But what customer, really, Don, what customer would really care if it's a 30-day uh, warranty? They're not going to buy it in the first place. Or they don't care. Or yeah, it's, it's a throwaway throw product, right? Yeah. I think of warranties as marketing. Yes. From my perspective, warranties are just how you market your product. Right. Uh, so we have a new, we have an automotive safety product that we were trying to launch. Mm -hmm. um, so for us, the best way to get it out there was to say, lifetime guarantee. Mm -hmm. Why did we do that? Is it, is it more expensive that way? Yeah, sure it is. But it's the marketing aspect of it. If right. anything goes wrong, we'll give you a brand new one. Right. Now, how did you calculate the cost of that marketing claim now? Uh, well, I know what our margins are. <laughs> <laughs> and I was willing to, to What's risk the risk? That. Right, yeah. what's the risk of, right. of that coming in? And there's a percentage of a percentage, and hopefully it doesn't eat everything. Right. right? I get it. So from, from my perspective, the warranty question is, is almost 100% how you want to do your marketing. It's a marketing expense, and how do you manage that expense? Mm -hmm. Because it, it's not about the product, it's about your reputation. Yep. 
you know, why does your 30-day warranty care? It has nothing to do with the product. It has everything to do with your reputation. So if you want to be in business next year, <laughs> you know, you have to keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. No, without a doubt. And so, you know, one of the things I'd look at is, and how do we, you know, when we look at predicting reliability for brand new products that we have no field data on, I want to talk a little bit about that. Because there's a lot of people who are doing net new novel things, and obviously, you know, we have that with sober steering. So what, what, do we, what are some of the tools we can use to predict reliability for some of these brand new products? Who wants to take that on? False premise. False premise. What does that mean? Expand. I don't think you can predict reliability. You okay. can manage risk, uh, but you can't like predict I know Bev will disagree. This is yeah. a chair moment, guys. I, uh, Nothing yeah. replaces field data. Okay. Uh, nothing replaces field data, correct, but I think Bob and I would both say that to a certain extent, you can predict reliability. I mean, um, no, I'm no expert in any way, shape, or form, but there are people that are experts that do me, uh, mean time to failure yep, for components and can build that up to mean time uh, for failure for a, a board and then to a product. Mm -hmm. And certainly companies like Nortel, uh, which I worked for 10 years, uh, did a lot of that, and they were building products with 15, 20, 25 year life um, expectancy. Um, the, you know, the infrastructure of the communication system of our country depended upon the reliability of these switches. And so they had to be able to do that and had to show that indeed the calculations and the resulting product would meet those predictions. Mm -hmm. So it can be done, but it can't be done cheaply. Right. And there's also confidence bands on any level. Of, Absolutely. You know, reliability is like black magic. Right? Your basic PCB, sure. Your product, different story. It's too complicated is what you're right. saying. Yeah, I understand. I mean, yeah, you can do mean time to failure on your PCBs, on your components, mm -hmm. but your actual product? It's complicated, but not necessarily too complicated, in my opinion, Catherine. Um, you, f for most of your major components, they have hours, uh, mean, mean time between failures, which is, can be inverted to failures per million hours or however you want to do it. And then it's largely a, sp a spreadsheet calculation. Those numbers actually tend up to, to be just kind of a starting point. What, for your own designs, we, we, all of the products I've worked on were um, pretty complicated electromechanical products. And what we would do, we learned to do, not we didn't always do it, is uh, start at the subassembly level and do what we call test break fix. And we would test it, and then we would uh, test it beyond its limits, and then we'd go beyond its limits again until something broke, then we would fix it. And then we would try to go beyond the limits again until it got to the point of diminishing returns uh, or got past the point of commercial feasibility. I mean, if you add mm. too much to the bomb, what's the point? Because that allowed you to characterize, allowed us to characterize uh, the performance, well, we, performance bounds of the product to, to, uh, to, to at least you know, one data point. Then you back off with confidence limits and you have some, therefore some confidence that you can achieve uh, a degree of reliability because your warranty costs are, are like an insurance policy. Mm -hmm. you're, you're probably taking some, some number on your balance sheet as, as an allowance for warranty. If you don't, if, if your warranty costs are worse than that, that comes straight off the bottom line and, and your reputation too, as right. you pointed out. So th th there, there are techniques uh, to accelerate li uh, life testing, to uh, test performance bounds that, uh, especially if you do it early on at the subassembly level as you work up, can be expensive, but they're not outrageously expensive, and they can save a, a whack of money down the road. Mm -hmm. Doing design verification is very important, and as Bob was saying, if you can get through sort of halt testing, which is highly accelerated life cycle testing, mm -hmm. um, and you can go to experts who understand what your product is going to go through, and you can go through those types of test methodologies and you know see what your product is doing, um, you can design to, as Bob was saying, just add more components or you know fix reliability failures that you're seeing. Um, a lot of stuff like drop testing and vibration testing, those are all things that you can do uh, to make sure that your product is working. Um, and then once it's in market, you can just assume that some of those things that you're doing will be equivalent or in market you'll see less of that, uh, mm. that kind of testing. You won't see that level of, uh, I guess, stress to your product. Right. So if you stress beyond what your product is, you're gonna see, 
then you can probably have a pretty reasonable expectation that's going to last longer. Right. I think that's part of the value of a lot of the testing you do. And it's, it's not, you're looking for where the failure points are going to occur. Mm -hmm. And then you can make a conscious decision on how to, or if to, correct and fix. Yeah. Right? Everything that is a fix is just additional time and development yeah. cost and, you know, potentially bomb costs. So those are all things that you need to weigh as the executive of your organization or the product manager of your organization. Right. How do you, how do you address those concerns? Mm -hmm. I just have a question. So you're like trying to find out your general best. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, if we have a product that we're expecting to last 10 years, right. you have to do that. You have to. But to say that you can predict the reliability of the product, particularly when there are net novel things that mm -hmm. have sensors on them and there aren't experts you can turn to to say, tell me how this sensor will respond in this environment, that's tough. So I, I have a hard for, you know, we can reduce our risk with the electronics surrounding the sensor, but to say, Well, and I think that's the, the challenge. There, there are, you know, we've had this discussion in past, past things in regards to you can't predict the moment in time that a button will fail. Don't care how smart the engineer is. You can't predict whether that sensor is going to fail, right? It's, you know, do we have a 90% confidence band or a 70% confidence band around the rough time that it will fail? And there may be a moment where it does fail on that day and you just got damn lucky. Stats is like that sometimes. And, and are you, the, the whole testing that we're talking about, that's a lot yeah. of uh, lab testing. Yeah, of course. And that's one thing. You know, to do accelerated lab testing, that's a, a very clear process. Totally. It's another thing when you put it in the bus and you didn't expect your driver to pour Coke on the sensor. <laughs> <laughs> or a double double. Right. Right? Absolutely. Unless you test for that. Unless you test for that. <laughs> and and at, Bla at Blackberry, we had a test which was this horrible concoction of fluids that were put on the product and then it was baked. And if it worked after that, you're good. <laughs> At Christie, we had the popcorn oil test because our projectors went into movie theaters and there actually is popcorn oil in the air and it would gum up the filters and the optics oh. and so on. So every, See? Yeah. There you go. I think a lot of it like, is just how much you know, effort are you going to put into this type of testing? And how much can you afford? Yeah, and how yes. much can you afford to do it? At BlackBerry, we had endless resources to test our products to the craziest degree. 100%. Um, and that might not be available, obviously, to a lot of startups and, mm -hmm. and smaller companies. So you've well, got to take that into account. Well, let's pull, pull on that thread because I think it's important from a startup perspective is like we can set this bar that is so darn high that nobody can possibly achieve it and they'll never launch a product, yeah. which is not the goal. The goal of this is to give you an understanding of some of the things to consider. And ultimately, we don't want you to launch one product. We want you to launch another one and another one and another one. It's because you haven't screwed up the first one. So the, the point of this is to say there is a bar and now it's a business decision and the impact that it has to you as a corporation to lowering that bar or making just certain choices. But it's about making sure that you make those choices in a um, conscious way versus just not considering them, right? So it, you know, it, it's interesting in terms of um, having to make those choices. And I'm looking for my question in my notes here. I think the, you know, the point of, and we've talked about shooting the engineer or what have you, but what's, when we, you mentioned about uh, accruing, in, accruing money on, the, uh, on, on your bomb, essentially in your business case. So can you talk a little bit more about that? I, I've talked to the startups a lot, a lot about their business case and ensuring that they have something accrued for warranty. But what are some of the typical numbers or what are some of the percentages that you would have done with your types of products? At, at Christie, we used to allow, we used to provide, not never allowed, yeah. uh, one and a half percent of sales as warranty expenses. Right. We started out at that and then we were able to reduce through historic through field data, mm -hmm. keeping your eye on the field, as Catherine says, is really, really important, right. to 1%. And we tried really hard to design the products that had less than 1%, because if we were less than 1% at the end of the year, when it closed the books, that the difference fell right to the bottom line. Yeah. And it was, it was, it, it was real money. Um, you can't get a 1% failure rate, though, or a warranty rate for the first hundred products you ship. It, it just isn't, you, because you're going to learn stuff in the field. Right. Customers will, as, as Catherine said, pour coke on the, um, uh, on the thing, or we, we, we'd forget about popcorn oil. I mean, just stuff happens. Right. But it, it is possible to do that. But field data is really important. And, but it, it's, a, it's a real insurance cost to you. 
and you can save a whack of money for your company by making the right trade-offs between perfection and an acceptable level. In our case, it was 1% mm -hmm. warranty expense. So. Yeah. And, and it's interesting. I, and 1%, I've, I designed business case with 2%. It's just, all it is is a piggy bank that at the end of the fiscal year, you can crack it open and put it to the bottom line. Hopefully, you don't have to spend it when it comes to field issues, but it's important to have that aside. What, with, with automotive types of products, without obviously telling us public or whatever information, but you know, what does a business case look like in terms of your warranty, what you would accrue to the side? Is it 10%? And they're not going to happen. <laughs> really? Okay. Put your mic on there as well. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Not going to happen. So there's no, so you do not, so what you're hearing from Gavin is you're not going to have money to put aside for a warranty cost. Oh, well, I have slush funds. Okay. Right? Slush so, funds, I mean, yeah. I know how I build in slush to my projections. Right. Okay. Got it. But I'm not going to put, I, 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 particularly at this point, I can't, I can say, yeah, I'm going to put a line item in my projections that says 2% of revenue is going to go to warranty. Mm -hmm. Is that going to stop me from spending it? No, not in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. And if I need more funds, then I need more funds, and that's an issue we have to deal with, um, mm -hmm. particularly at this early stage. A year from now, 18 months from mm -hmm. now, sure, entirely different story. But right now, when we're launching a product, right. my resources are going to development, team, testing, this sort of thing, mm -hmm. not the inevitable what-ifs. Mm -hmm. Because if I don't have a product in the market, the what-ifs don't matter. Hmm. And I know that's, you know, terrible to say. I would like to say that, yes, we're accruing a 2% slash fund to account for things that happen in the next 12 months. But realistically speaking, I've got three other products in development. And if something big happens, then, you know, we have to, you know, shift our resources and allocate separately at that time. Hmm. So when you, when you think of your bill of material and just your overall cost of delivering a product to customers. Uh, are you considering warranty as just a piece of that, or how do you do that? I'd be curious to know. I, I don't consider it part of the bomb. I consider it part of our larger projections, our business case. Oh, okay. That's just the way that, that we do it. You've because it. our products are early, mm. quite frankly. And also, we don't, uh, we don't do installation. We have ah. our clients do the installation. That's interesting. Yeah, so that, that adds a sort of complexity when we're talking about our specific bomb, because that there yeah. could be issues, warranty-related issues that aren't. Right. Well, let's talk about that. We got a we got a minute here, and actually, it's interesting because I'm so I'm assuming Bob Christie, you didn't have trained reps that who went out, or your employees did not go out and install. You had third-party folks install. You have people who are third-party install. So, what do you what are you doing in terms of managing that relationship? Uh, how are you ensuring that they install your stuff the correct way? Tough. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is where you have the unexpected problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can give someone a single sheet of paper that has four lines of instructions, and you would be shocked yeah, they'll at screw the up different three ways of them. that they interpret <laughs> those four lines. Uh, so really, this has been more, diffi more difficult than we had ever intended, mm -hmm. uh, getting them to do it, getting them to do it correctly. Mm -hmm. Now, why do we do it? Because installations are a nightmare. How do I know that? Because our product was late and we had to take on installations for some of our clients because our product was late. And we wanted no part of it. We did not project for it. Going forward, we want no part of the installation process. Right. So what are we going to do going forward? Well, from our experience, the videos are going to be the best right. option for us. We went in, because we have a limited number of clients. Again, we're working in our backyard. Uh, so mm -hmm. because we're in our backyard, we have the ability to go and train our specific clients. This has been a huge learning curve for us to understand how these mechanics interpret our technology and how they use it. So based on our experience with them, you know, we stepped away, we've put some instruction manuals together, we've modified the instruction manuals, we're going to go to video instruction manuals. Mm. Uh, so that it's 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 they can see it and it's much easier. Mm. It's based the, on yeah, the field data. The installation nonsense is a mess and it's expensive and it's just I hate it. Um, so yeah, that's if it wasn't for customers. Damn it, it'd right, be perfect. Right, you know, mess. The customers are fine. It's their mechanics that are the issue. Uh, so yeah, and I would just to one more point on the warranty. Um, you know, when you when you take the slush fund, the one or two percent. I think that only becomes meaningful when you're tracking the problems. So right from day one, if you see problems coming in, you have to really closely track them and understand them so that you can see the patterns 
which will develop into your warranty projections. So if you've got product coming in, don't just put it to the side. Understand exactly what the problems are and then track them on a single sheet so you can see those patterns developing clearly because that's what will define what your warranties are and, and mm. how you develop going forward. Yeah, yeah. categorize and parade all that stuff would be your best friends. Yeah. Very cool. Okay, we're out of time. So what I'll do is thank you all uh, for the time, certainly, and just hopefully the insights that were provided are uh, somewhat helpful in uh, launching hardware products and just the importance of reliability, longevity, durability uh, to the ongoing success of the company, not just that short-term candy that you get, but the end, the end of being able to launch more than one product are going to be really important for you. Okay, so with that, I thank you all for coming out. Thank you. Uh, so one, that was really great. Thank you, Don and panel. Uh, also, we have gifts for you. They're coming around the corner. Um, we have given uh, gifts to all the panelists throughout uh, this whole series, but uh, we did actually end up getting one for Don because uh, while him and I have yelled at each other throughout this whole session, uh, as soon as I asked him to do this for us, he immediately came back to me and said, can I bill you for those hours? I'm just kidding. He said yes. Um, and uh, he's been really, really great. So uh, thank you all for coming out. I know some of you came for all four weeks, and we're really, really happy that this went well, and we're probably going to do another iteration of it again because you may as well fail faster. So this wasn't a failure, I care to admit. So uh, yeah, it's about it. Thanks again, guys. Uh, really appreciate it.